friends and spiritual seekers so this is kind of part four of the basics to witchcraft series and this one we're going to be talking about how to build up your spells and astral projection <laughs> So how do you build a spell? Well, it seems like a simple question, but it's a very hard question to answer because it all depends on what type of spell you want to do, what type of practice you practice, if you want it to be basic, more advanced, do you want it to be a short-term spell or short-term goal, is it a long-term goal? There's so many questions and different aspects that would really give you that final answer. But here's kind of like the most kind of common ones that you'll see. So the most common things you'll see are spell jars and sachets, sometimes there's just like sigils or candles. There's spells you can do with just plants or nature or in the water and the list kind of goes on and on and on from there. The common things you'll see across the board is using ingredients that are pretty common across the aspects. But let's kind of go over the common ingredients. So usually spells contain some type of herb, whether you're adding that to something or putting it on a candle or burning it or burying it, whatever. And what we're doing with herbs is we're actually trying to pull out the energy of that plant. So different herbs are used for different purposes. Other common things you see are oils. So you can use essential oil. Sometimes you can just use a carrier oil. So this is just like a mild oil, uh, like olive oil, coconut oil, jojoba oil, things like that. Essential oils, there are magical properties attached to those oils that you would use that purpose for. Other things you may see are like crystals or seashells, nails, wood, ribbon, etc, etc, etc. These can be used on their own or added to a spell. So how do you build a spell? So there's lots of spells online. There's a few on my TikTok. There's I'm going to be adding more onto my YouTube in the future of here's how you do it kind of step by step. But if you're going to build one on your own, they are definitely the more powerful ones. If you're using your intuition on what you need and what you need to use to bring about the spell that you want. So this is my base. This is how I'm going to build from there. I typically use a lot of herbs into my spells, so then I kind of decide what herbs I want to use. Research what kind of herbs are associated with the type of spell you're doing and just kind of feel out which ones you're being drawn to. Then I would build up with maybe an oil or an essential oil throw in a crystal, if there's other aspects that I might want to include, like writing out on a parchment paper, using a specific color, to ca color candle or cord, this will kind of like seal up the jar if that's what I'm trying to do. So then I would just gather all of my materials, everything that I need to do, and get ready to perform the spell. Now there's no one way to perform a spell. Yes, in the basics when, like in my, I think my first video was like casting your circle, making sure you're invoking all the energies you want to invoke, and then do your spell and do the reverse process to let everything go. Absolutely, you can, you can do that. And you should in the beginning while you're still trying to acquaint yourself with the different energies, what they feel like, how to manipulate them, all that kind of stuff. But once you're kind of more familiar with that, then you can start exploring doing spells in different settings. So if it's a spell you feel like you need to cast a circle to protect yourself or to keep all of the energy contained, absolutely do that. But it's not required. You can do a spell just quickly off the fly. Doing it outside is definitely beneficial, especially if you're doing some kind of cleansing or trying to invoke the energies of nature. Doing it outside in your backyard with no big formal process will work just fine. You can also do rituals in the bath or shower, in bed, when you're laying down, meditating. You can invoke spells during that time as well. Just like anything else, when you're learning and trying to explore what works for you, following a rigid plan every time and only doing one process all the time, you're not gonna be able to grow. You're not gonna be able to explore what could potentially work better if you're not willing to break out of the mold. The only warning I have as far as like when you're building your own spells is not to put in too much. I think of this as a recipe, say a recipe for cake. If you have your base ingredients, so like your flour, sugar, butter, eggs, that's your base, right? Every spell, so that could be your spell jars or your candles, that's your base. Then you're going to add on top of that. So maybe you want to do a more of a spice cake. So you might add in some cinnamon and some clove, some nutmeg, just a little bit, dash it in to make your base ingredients more specific to the spell or the cake that you're trying to make. 
Now, if you try to get into too much, so it's, I like spice cake, but I also like vanilla cake. I also like chocolate cake. I also like carrot cake. And your thought process is, well, I like all of this and all of this tastes good. So I'm going to put it all in. Yeah. Now in a cake, it's going to be disgusting. And in a spell, there's no direction. So it just, can't do anything it's just going to be all muddled up and it's not really going to be focused on achieving anything so that's how i kind of focus my spells is yes you want to add things that will benefit you or add to the spell but not too much and too many things at once that the spell ends up just being muddy a spell is just a way to focus your intention and to focus your manifestations it could be as simple as just saying a chant to yourself writing a sigil on a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to make a fancy giant spell jar that, you know, stick it in the corner and it's just going to magically work. That's not exactly how it works. It's all about the power and the intention you put behind it on whether it's going to be successful or not. Another part of spell work that a lot of people like to ignore or not mention is you need to open up channels for that spell to work. If I, I could make a hundred spells right now, spell jar sachet, some sigils, etc., and make them all for one purpose, it isn't just gonna magically appear in my life. I need to open up channels for it to come to me. And that's true for any type of manifestation, whether you're doing spell work or meditation, yoga, Reiki, whatever, it's you need to have channels open. So even though I can sit down for an hour and make a spell, I still need to do things in my real life, in my day-to-day -day life, to open up the channels for that spell to work and to direct whatever I'm trying to achieve towards me. So my final note in regards to spell work is that there's no right or wrong way to do it. If it's part of your practice and in the style that you're learning or exploring, it's gonna be okay. Obviously you need to take caution in that if you're gonna be dabbling in, you know, more darker stuff or involving other people and things like that, it can backfire. So I mean, you obviously need to take caution in what you're doing. So as a beginner, you really should just start with protection, removing negativity, um, you can do like love, self-love, success and money, things that just involve you. Involving things that, that involve other people's free will and things like that, that's when things can get really dangerous and you can start manipulating things that you probably don't want to manipulate and you don't always get back the way you think it's going to get back. So for an example, if you're trying to manipulate someone else's actions it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to affect you positively okay hard pill that could be a hard pill to swallow when some people like to promote that spell work and witchcraft you can do whatever you want it's always going to work out that's not true manipulating somebody else's actions doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to benefit benefit you in the end i think you might be manipulating them to make a decision on something. It doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be the decision you want them to make. And there's nothing really you can do about it after that. So to wrap up the spell work stuff, don't be scared to try new things, take your time, try building some spells yourself, while also following recipes and exploring other, t other styles of spells that people have created. That's gonna give you a good idea of the type of spell work that you like. So now I'm gonna talk about astral projection. I've seen a few things being thrown around about astral projection. There's definitely types of witchcraft where that's a big aspect of their practice. That's not me personally, but some people that's like a big part, main point of their practice is this astral projection. And I find a lot of people are kind of jumping into this astral projection like it's like it's a big fantastical, you know, fantasy driven type experience. And it's not. And I don't really know why people think it is. It could be mis in, could be misinformation or them not really understanding what astral projection means, but it's really not that. So what astral projection really is is your spiritual body, whether you call that a soul, your spirit, whatever, leaving your physical body and controlling it outside of your physical body. That's what it is in its basic description. 
Now, I've seen people talk about going to other planets and universes and whatever. Personally, don't do that. I like my body and I have no reason to visit Jupiter. I, I really don't. Um, a lot of times when I am astral projecting, I'm just visiting other energies, other people's spirits, things like that. So for an example of times that I have astral projected is in like group meditations. So I will, it, during a group meditation, I will astral project myself outside of my physical body to visit other people's spirits in the room, usually for healing purposes, because then I can really connect with that person and kind of see, I can help them move their energy or help them heal in something that they might be struggling with or just to kind of get a sense of what is their issue like what do they need to work on because a lot of times people are so um tightened up you know so protective of themselves that when i can connect with their spiritual self there's no there's no barriers right there's no walls up our spirits aren't like that they don't think like our human brains do of i can't say this i need to protect myself whatever you can really connect with people in that way. So that has been a beneficial way of me to use astral projection and I haven't really done much more than that. I have done some further astral projections like during meditation processes, which were a little bit uncontrolled, kind of just seeing what's happening. Um, I've been like sent to other places as far as like somebody else running the meditation and I'm, and like they are moving me spiritually, which I gave him full permission to do that. That's why I was there, kind of stuff like that. But as far as controlling it myself, I don't really do that because I don't need to. I don't feel a need to. I don't really see the purpose in it um, to do it on my own volition. So how do you astral project? So it can be a skill that can be hard to kind of conceptualize for one and to really master. So the easiest way to like start trying to astral project is just astral projecting yourself into your own room, where you are. So if you're laying down on your bed, nice and comfortable, you need to be very, very relaxed and in a deep meditative state to really, to really do this. So get into a very deep meditation the best you can and vividly try to visualize and get yourself up out of your physical body and just project yourself into your room. And the way you kind of do that is because it's familiar space, right? So you're safe, there's nothing to be f afraid of, there's nothing to worry about, you know, crazy animals or anything like that appearing. You're going to be in your own room and you already are aware of it. So you need to try to astral project yourself to things that you already know and are familiar with. So such as going up into your, going to your dresser and feeling an object on your dresser going to your closet and feeling your clothes, the different textures of your clothes. And when you can really, really feel it and you can, you can move yourself around easily, then you kind of know you're doing it. That's when you kind of know like, okay, I'm, I can move here and now I'm touching this, I can move here and now I'm touching that, I'm moving this, I'm moving that, whatever. That's when you kind of know you're doing it. And then you can kind of go and grow from there. I also recommend only doing short stints at a time like doing five ten minutes at a time because you don't want to wear yourself out when your energy when your spirit is outside of your body it wears out your body very quickly usually you feel very tired after astral projection if you're doing it right you're going to feel very very tired you're also going to want to ground yourself afterwards which i'll mention i'll mention later so you don't want to be outside of your body for too long until you kind of work up you know a kind of a tolerance when you start working up a tolerance then you can kind of do longer and longer stints without it affecting your physical body too much you also want to remember that in your astral form you're not necessarily going to look exactly the way you do physically this is my physical body this is what my face looks like this is what my body looks like my height the way i move my mannerisms all that kind of stuff is a lot of it is tied to my physical body but my astral body looks quite different my face is very similar but my body is very different i walk a lot smoother in my astral form um i have wings sometimes depending on what i'm doing so my astral body does not look exactly like my physical body but when i'm in that body like when i'm out of my physical body i can feel that 
body, that form. And that's part of recognizing if you're doing astral projection or, or not, if you're just imagining it, is you're gonna have a completely different feeling body and it's gonna feel natural. It's gonna feel so natural to be in this astral form that it's not gonna feel foreign or forced or you're trying to imagine what it's like to be in this type of body or this, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever. Um, so that's a note too that I don't see a lot of people talking about is your astral body is not necessarily gonna be like your physical body. So making sure that you are taking care of yourself, your physical body after your astral projecting, you're gonna feel very floaty or you can feel very floaty afterwards. So a big part of it is grounding. Easiest way to ground yourself is by eating some salt. So like having some salty chips or deli meat or you know something that contains a lot of salt, it'll very quickly ground you. You could also just do a quick like thinking process of grounding yourself back to the earth. So not necessarily going back into full meditation, but as you're kind of coming out of your meditation, just kind of like take a couple minutes to go like, okay, tying myself to the earth, my roots are in the ground, you know, just kind of like tying yourself back down to earth or down into grounding, because that'll definitely help you later on making sure that you are staying hydrated and you're like well fed, all that kind of stuff afterwards. Usually you want to have a snack, some water, just kind of like help you reground, re-cleanse, resettle yourself back into your physical body. And that'll definitely help you out in the long term as far as you're not gonna feel exhausted doing it because that can, you know, may motivate you not to do it. You're not gonna feel motivated to do it if you feel like crap every time afterwards. So it's just, you need to make sure that you take care of your physical body as well. So this is gonna be the end of the Beginner Witch series. I hope you guys learned something, at least one thing, that's the main goal. Um, I, next week on Witchy Wednesday, it's gonna be just a random topic and uh, we'll go from there. If there's anything you would like me to cover, absolutely put it down below or let me know over on Instagram and uh, I'll try to help you guys out as much as I can. So again, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next week.